thank you very much and thank you to the organizer for the for the invitation um, i'm sorry i am a bit um, i have kind of a cold so i um, i might cough a bit but uh, so i will try to be straight with that um Okay, so I'm going to talk about uh, some recent work that I have been doing with uh, Sergei Dubovsky and Massimo Purrati at NYU, and which concerns uh, what I call non-relevant deformation of quantum field theories, which encompasses both irrelevant and marginal deformations. And with these denomination, I mean that what are known as double current deformations. Uh, and uh, I will present a, a method, so a technique to interpret this deformation as from the path integral point of view, which I, I called topological gauging. Um, and this work is, is also proceeding with uh, Ricardo Borsato uh, at the moment. So we are also working together on some extensions of this, uh, of this method. Uh, also, if um, if there are some questions, I will try to be introductory as much as I can, but if there are any questions, please just ask them and I will try to answer. All right. Uh, right. So uh, this is a table of content. I will start by um, talking about the formations in, uh, in quantum field theories and in particular from the perspective of the space of theories. And this should serve as a sort of a motivation of the, um, giving some reason for uh, for why we are interested in in, uh, in studying these deformations, what is interesting about them. And um, then I will present these family of double current deformations. And then I will move to, to present how to obtain this deformation from a path integral point of view via this, uh, um, this procedure, this topological gauging. Now, there are two cases. One is the case where these currents that enter the deformation are abelian currents, which is much easier. And that's the first thing that I will I will show you. And the other case is the case where we are dealing with non-abelian currents, so currents that belong to a certain to a certain algebra. And this is a slightly more complicated. There is some some modification involved in this procedure, but it's it's entirely possible to do so. And I will talk about it at the end of the talk. And now this uh, topological gauging procedure is uh, a very mm, a nice way to reframe this double current deformation and allows us to understand how to compute certain observable and why these observable are so simple in the deformed model. And I will present some example, the scattering matrix, uh, but it's possible to compute also the partition function on the torus or on various geometries. And also in principle, also expectation values or uh, correlation functions. And then I will show how these double current deformation in the abelian case are really nothing else but a TST transformation. And this procedure that I, I will present makes it rather clear that this is this is what's going on. Um, and then I will move with non to non-abelian currents, to, which corresponds to a generalization of TST, uh, which is known as young baxter deformation. And as, at the end, I will present an example, uh, the case of TT bar, which is the most famous of these double current deformations. And I will explain how this TT bar deformation enters the game and how it is related to, to centrally extended Poincaré and to non-commutative space time. And then there will be some output. Okay, so let's start by talking about the formations. So um, I will consider um, a theory which is very close to an RG fixed point. So I place myself, I choose some, some reference action, some CFT action, and I look at the region of space, uh, which is very close to this, um, to this CFT. So I have various possibility of how to deform these theories. I, I can choose to deform with a relevant operator. Here there is just one, but in principle, I have more than one relevant operator. Um, I can choose to deform with a marginal operator or with an irrelevant operator. And here I subdivide them into relevant, marginal, and irrelevant, and these are um, exactly marginal. And I put uh, marginally relevant and marginally irrelevant in the two other categories. And so actually these um, are just indicative. We, 
they really are defined by the quantum correction, the, the position that they hold here. Um, now, there are various, um, there are several differences uh, of what happens when we deform with these different uh, type of operators. We all know that we, if we deform a, a CFT with a relevant operator, what we get is a UV complete theory. And this is quite uh, obvious because the relevant operator is relevant in the IR and it becomes not, not important in the UV. So what we are doing here, we are really taking a UV CFT and we are going out of the CFT with some following some relevant direction. Uh, and since the procedure mm -hmm. of, um, of renormalization group uh, consists in taking away um, degrees of freedom going towards the IER, we don't expect any, any pathology to arise when we try to follow the theory from the UV to the IER. So this is a perfectly well-defined theory at all scales. If we, de if we use a marginal operator instead to deform our theory, what happens is that this exactly marginal operator do not, um, do not scale with the RG. So what we are looking at in this case, we're looking at the conformal manifold, which is around um, the CFD action. So these coefficients um, are coordinates on this manifold and allows us to move between different CFTs that lies um, connected to the original one. And finally, perhaps more interestingly, more, more inter interestingly uh, this is the case that I'm really interested in understanding, is the case where we deform a CFT or in general a theory with an irrelevant operator. Then what happens here is that uh, in this case, we do expect pathologies to arise. And that's because they behave in the opposite ways uh, uh, as relevant operators. So when we flow to the, to the IR, they are not important, but they are very important when we go to the UV. So we, are, we cannot interpret these as um, flowing out of a UV CFT with um, a relevant, uh, sorry, an irrelevant operator. Um, and when we try to go to, to small scales, then we do expect pathologies to arise due to the presence of these. We can see that in various ways. The, perhaps the most intuitive is that if we try to do some perturbative expansion in the alpha, we find out that there is an accumulation of divergences and our theory is non-predictive because we need to introduce an infinite number of counter terms. Is it possible that... Uh... Mm -hmm the dimension of the relevant operator changes under the marginal deformation such that it becomes irrelevant. Uh, so you mean if I deform a CFT with a marginal? And the relevant. So and I, I relevant. It, and then the marginal drives it away from the original fixed point. So this might change the dimension of the relevant operator you started yeah. with such yeah, that it becomes uh, irrelevant. Oh, that's interesting. I don't have an answer to that, but that sounds an interesting proposition. Okay. Right. I would need to think about it. Yeah, thanks for the suggestion. I will think about it. So do you have any reason why you are introducing only one relevant operator? Oh, no, 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 no. That's just, it's just notation. You can have, a, I mean, in principle, you want to, to sort of separate the contribution of relevant operators, but you can, in principle, deform with any number of them. So now this is just a pictorial way. It's just, you know, a, a way to organize my thought and to subdivide the various contribution. But uh, really what I'm going to focus on is marginal and irrelevant uh, deformation. So I won't be looking at relevant uh, operators. Okay, so to um, so let me introduce this space of theories. This is a, an old idea that goes back to Wilson and Kogut. Um, so it's almost fifty years old uh, by now. And what they propose is to understand the renormalization group flow from a geometric perspective. So they they state that we should look at a space. Um, which is where each point of the space is labeled by an action and each action is equipped with a UV cutoff. 
um, and these actions are integrals of local densities. So we only require that these uh, are integrals of um, fun functionals of fields evaluated at the same point, fields and all the derivative. And in principle, we can allow any number of derivatives uh, entering inside L. And, and we integrate by keeping in mind that we have a UV cutoff. So we only uh, take care of um, um, configurations that have a momentum less than lambda. And what they call this space is the space of quasi-local field theories. And the meaning of quasi-locality here is that the theories described by these actions, uh, they do allow uh, non-local uh, features, but only we, we restrict these non-local features in, um, in a range which is smaller than the, uh, than the size that we use to probe our theory. So lambda, the inverse of lambda is some, some length scale. And this is the, the size that we look at our system, that we use to look at our system. Um, so as long as there are no local features but are restricted below this scale, then the theory that we are considering lies inside this space. And this, we can look at it more or less as a, as a manifold, even though it's a more complicated object, it's not very clear what kind of mathematical construct it is, but it has many features of a manifold. So for the sake of this talk, I will just suppose that, that this is a manifold, which means that I can define a tangent space. Um, and the tangent space in this case is the space of fields of my theory, is a space of direction that I can follow to, to deform my theory. And on this space, I can write the RG as a flow in this way, a flow controlled by the logarithm of the scale. Uh, and the direction of the and the intensity of this flow is uh, dictated by some vector field, so an element of the vector space in this way. Now I can choose to uh, integrate this flow either forward in time, which is the, the natural way uh, to, to proceed, and what happens is that the, the variation of the length scale is positive, so I'm going towards larger scales, so I'm going towards the IR, and I don't expect any pathology. Um, this again in the picture where uh, the RG, um, you perform the RG by integrating out degrees of freedom. Uh, this is kind of natural because you start with a theory which has more degrees of freedom and you go to a theory which has less, so you don't expect any pathology to arise. But for the same reason, if you try to integrate backwards in the RG time, so you try to go to smaller and smaller scales, you do expect at some point to have some kind of pathology um, because you might encounter a situation where you need more degrees of freedom to describe your physics than you started with. And also from this point of view, uh, if epsilon decreases, at some point it might encounter uh, this locality range. And then at that point, the theory at that scale will lie outside the space of theories. And this is, uh, this is some intrinsic UV scale um, such that the action lies outside the space of theories whenever the, the lambda scale is, is bigger than this lambda star. And of course, we know that there is a whole set of UV complete QFTs, so QFTs for which this lambda star is infinite. And these are theories uh, that lies in the space of theories for any scale. So they are well-defined for any scale. And so this is some, some pictorial representation of what I just said. Uh, we, we have some, some manifold, for example, around the CFT, and if we can deform one X, one element of this space, uh, with a relevant operator and what happens is we either flow to another manifold, we can flow to another CFT or to an empty theory, um, or we can, um, we can move on this CFT by controlling uh, the, the parameters of the irrelevant operators, or we can choose to, to deform with an irrelevant operator. So we can choose to define a flow. Now this won't be an RG flow, of course, we are forcing our theory to, to vary in a certain way, which is dictated by this uh, this irrelevant operator, um, as we as we change some coupling parameter, and we do expect at some point just to to escape from the space of theories, and we don't really know what lies out here. We cannot describe it for the reason that I told before, because the theory becomes non-predictive, so we don't really know how to uh, how to interpret what lies here. But now the the very 
in two dimension, there is a whole family of theories. And in general, for a generic uh, starting point, we can define a TT bar deformation, which is an irrelevant deformation, but is a very peculiar irrelevant deformation because it's a, a, it allows you complete control on its observables, even though it's irrelevant. Uh, we can compute is it smart? It, it's its matrix. We can compute a number of, uh, of other observables, and they all make sense anywhere along this uh, flow. So at all scales, they have peculiar features. Uh, so we can go deep in the UV and try to understand uh, what happens when we exit from the space of theories. This is one of the reasons, uh, the, the principal reason, at least for me, why these theories are interesting. Um, so the TT bar flow is defined in this way. Uh, is uh, we we define the dependence of an action on an additional parameter alpha uh, by this this flow equation, which contains the determinant of the energy momentum tensor. Um, now this is a classical definition, uh, of course. But the fact that the energy momentum tensor is conserved is what makes this well-defined well -defined at the quantum level. And this is because we have two operators. Of course, we need to take care at the quantum level when we put them in the same, at the same point in space-time. Uh, but we can do that and we can, we can see that the, the, using the OPE of the energy momentum tensor, what we get is really uh, when we when we take two energy momentum tensor or we put them together, we do get this operator and we get a series of corrections to that. One of that is the trace of the energy uh, is the trace of the energy momentum tensor times some uh, some delta function. So we get a contact term, and then we get a whole tower of uh, derivative of total derivatives. So what this means is that we can take care of the contact term by just redefining uh, the rotating the space of fields. So this doesn't really uh, do anything. And the whole tower of uh, total derivatives do not really contribute to, to the quantum, to the expectation values that we're going to compute. And what this means is that we have complete control. So in principle, we can take this uh, definition and put it inside a path integral and do computations. Um, and this theory has, on top of that, has a series of interesting uh, features. It's a completely controllable, it's actually solvable, this theory. And, and what by solvable means that, um, I mean that we can take some observable, and in this case, for example, we can take the energy in um, uh, the finite size energy for some state n, n is some label that labels my uh, my states. E zero will be the ground state, um, and these energies satisfy uh, some differential equation, which in this case is the Burgers equation, which is written here. Which means that we can compute the energy of the deformed model when we know the energy of the undeformed one. And I wish to stress that TT bar can be done for any theory, not just integrable theories. Um, so we can start also from a non-integrable theory. The problem would be that we won't have starting point in principle, while in integrable theory, we can in principle compute the energy of the ground state and of the excited states. Um, and so pictorially what happens is, is presented here, if we have a generic, um, so this is a general uh, shape of a ground state energy. We have some bulk energy at large uh, distances, and we have some uh, CFT behavior at small distances like this. Uh, when we turn on alpha, depending on its sign, we have two, uh, two possibilities. So for alpha less than zero, um, these Burgess equation without the momentum, P is the momentum, I forgot to say. Um, if we forget about this, so in the case where momentum is zero, this equation, what it does, it simply uh, affects um, uh, an affine transformation on this plane. So this axis, this vertical axis is, is bent toward the right for alpha less than zero, and the curve will develop um, a branch cut. And this branch cut is, um, is a Hagedon transition, the same kind of Hagedon transition that we see in string theory. And we can see that by computing the from the ground state energy, computing the, the entropy density and the density of states. And we see that the density of state grows much faster than an exponential, just as it does in, 
in string theory. Um, and of course, the energy becomes complex below this, this radius. On the other hand, when alpha is bigger than zero, we get the opposite situation. So we get an energy that goes to a constant at r equals zero. And this is also surprising because this means that the system has a finite number of degrees of freedom, which is kind of puzzling because we are dealing with some quantum field theory. So um, there is some interpretation that was given by Magog, Medzei, and Verlinde, and they propose to, from a holographic point of view, to interpret the deformation of the theory living on the boundary as pushing the boundary of ADS towards the bulk. And now, if in the since in the bulk there is um, gravity, um, if the boundary is at infinity, we can put in the bulk a black hole of any size, so we don't have any bound on the number of degrees of freedom. But if the bulk is pushed, to, if the boundary is pushed toward the bulk, so it's a finite distance, then there is a, a, a bound on how big our black hole can be, and this gives a bound on the number of degrees of freedom. Uh, all right. So, and there, there are also other observables. One of the most important and most striking is the fact that the S matrix is deformed simply by a phase factor in this way. This is an example for the two particle S matrix, but there is a, there exists a formula for the N particle S matrix also in non-integrable <clears throat> theories. It's just a phase that contains the product of momenta of the incoming and outgoing particles. Um, all right. So any question? Good. Uh, so the, um, this TT bar deformation, as many of you probably know, it, it has a lot of um, features, a lot of uh, interesting uh, characteristics. In the, first of all, as I mentioned, it's a universal uh, deformation. We can do that for any um, any QFT as long as it possesses an energy momentum tensor. Um, it is related to string theory. We see that from the quantum uh, energy for the ground state energy on a, uh, in a box, as I said before, from this Hagedon transition, but also at the classical level, you can see that if you take a free boson and you do the TT bar deformation, you get the Nambu-Goto action. It is the result contained in, in, in this first article um, on the topic. And it's also related to quantum gravity. And this also can be seen both at the quantum and at the classical level. At the classical level, uh, this is a, um, um, you see that from the fact that you can undo the deformation by, uh, by defining a change of variable that depends on the energy and the momentum of the system. So you couple the, gra the geometry of your system to, um, to the energy of your system. And if you tune this deformation, this um, redefinition correctly, you can undo the TT bar deformation at the level of equation of motion. So this is reminiscent of gravity, of what gravity does. And at the quantum level, this is seen uh, by showing that the TT bar deform theory is equivalent to the original theory coupled to a JT gravity uh, sector, so to a topological gravity sector. And this was presented in these articles by Dubovsky. Gurbenko, Mirpabai, and Hernandez Schiffle. Um, right, and then this theory can be generated, this city bar deformation can be generalized in various ways. And the one that I'm going to focus on here is uh, um, a generalization of um, either by considering a different CTD factor. So we take the deformation of this matrix that I showed before as a definition of my theory. Uh, and now we substitute the e to the minus alpha m sinh theta by some more general CDD, which needs to be a phase, needs to satisfy a certain set of constraints. Um, and this is something that was actually looked at uh, before the appearance of TT bar. Uh, Alyosha Zamalochikov first uh, um, was interested in, in this uh, kind of deformation and many other authors. I just put some uh, some exponents here. Mossardo and Simonetti. Mossardo did several papers um, where he looked at uh, various kind of uh, CDD, um, the effect of CDDs uh, in, in an S matrix. And also in the work of uh, Dubowski, Flagger, and Gobrek, Casale, Firavanti, Liotz, and Tateo, uh, they were um, trying to, uh, to 
find the S-matrix for Nambugoto and the correction for that in the context of uh, um, effective string uh, in QCD. Um, and this kind of, of uh, CDD factors appeared in their work too. Um, and then equivalently, we can look at this generalization as changing the currents that we use in the flow equation. And this is a perspective that was um, that I looked at in, in a series of paper, a series of papers with various collaborators. And what I'm going to focus on is, is really this perspective. And I'm going to present a way to uh, rephrase this flow equation in general uh, from a quantum point of view, from a path integral point of view. Right. So double current deformation in general are, uh, can be defined in this way. So we take the TT bar flow that I presented you before, and we just substitute uh, J's instead of T. And um, again, we have this uh, feature. We have a, um, a, we need to do point splitting when we want to go to the uh, quantum level. And we need to make sure that this is a well-defined operator. And Again, the, the important feature here is that the current is conserved. If the current is conserved, then this, uh, this is a well-defined object. It contains derivatives, uh, only total derivatives in its expansion, in its OPE. Um, but the problem is that this is only true in general if alpha is equal to zero. So if we try uh, to take these in general, if we have two uh, non-abelian currents and we try to, if, um, we, we compute the first corrections, so we expand this in alpha, and we look at the first correction in alpha, then we see that J is, is not conserved at first order in alpha. And the reason is this, the presence of this epsilon tensor here. So we can be slightly more general, and we can put an R tensor here, which needs to be anti-symmetric, um, anti of course. And what we find is that we can make this current conserved, at all alpha, but only if omega, which is the inverse of R, is a two cycle for the algebra that these currents live in. So this is the condition of two cycle. F are the structure constant of the symmetry algebra. So what this means is that if we have a non-abelian current, and I will, uh, if we have non-abelian currents, I will return to that uh, later. Um, we can define a consistent double current deformation such that the currents keep on being conserved, but only in the case where the algebra allows for a non-trivial Tuco cycle, which is equivalent to say that the algebra allows for a non-trivial central extension. So not algebra, not all algebra will, would work. For example, SON wouldn't, uh, won't work in this case. We need some more complicated example. Um, but let, let us, for the moment, I will focus on the abelian case. So in the abelian case, you can always play this game. You just put an epsilon tensor in place of R. And I define my currents in an invariant way. So instead of using another procedure, and here the point is that I'm starting with a system with some symmetries, and I use the currents associated to the symmetries. But instead of using the Noether theorem, I, I choose to define them in terms of uh, the response under a variation of a background field. So I couple, I do a minimal coupling of my theory with some gauge field A, and I define my currents as the variation of this action with respect to the gauge field. Right, and now I can play some game with the, with the flow equation that is defined here. So I can look at first order in alpha, what happens? And I see that, uh, of course, well, this is uh, quite evident. The difference will be given by this uh, expression. And now I notice that this expression, when I exponentiate it, I can treat it with a Haber-Stratonovich transform. So I can write it in terms of these gauge fields, A, of an integral over these gauge fields. And, and I also notice that the definition of the currents implies these, um, this identity always at first order in alpha. So what combining all these observation, I see that the action, the deformed action can be written at first order as a path integral over some gauge field of the original action minimally coupled to this gauge field plus some perturbation, um, some object that perturb my theory. Now the, what I what I will do is that I will jump and say, well, I take this expression and I make it exact. So I say that this is a definition of a alpha to all order in alpha. 
And then I check that this definition reproduces my classical flow equation. And it does indeed reproduce that. So this is just a matter of doing the saddle point, uh, saddle point on, this, uh, on, this, um, on this expression here. And the saddle point tells me that A is connected with, uh, with the Hodge of J. And I just do some computation, do some substitution, and I see that this flow equation in pink is satisfied. Um, right, so what I'm doing here with this definition, I am uh, introducing a quantum definition of the classical flow that, um, that I presented before. Um, but there is still one tiny detail that I want to add. Uh, and it is the fact that I want my current to be conserved. And now from this subtle point, this would mean that A needs to be flat. So the A needs to be zero. Uh, sorry, needs to be flat, needs to be closed. Uh, but this is something that I, uh, in this uh, perspective, I need to add by hand. So I would like it to be contain inside my definition. And this is easily done. This is simply a matter of adding a Stuckelberg field. So adding some additional field X. And here you see that X imposes the flatness uh, of A directly. And in addition, it also grants gauge invariance to the whole, uh, to the whole action. And this forces the current to be conserved when I do subtle points on this, uh, this, on this definition. <laughs> I'm sorry. Okay. Now I can manipulate this um, uh, this definition in, in several ways. One one of them, well, one of the simplest one is if I consider my theory in a completely topologically tri trivial space time, so an empty featureless space time. I have no insertion. I have no boundaries. I have no cycles. Then the fact that A is closed means that A is an exact form. And this exact form is given by this. And now um, I can fix x to be zero. This is just a gate choice. And I see that I can essentially follow this chain of identity to see that the deformation does, uh, everything that the deformation does in this space is to rotate the fundamental fields. And now if I don't have any insertion in the path integral, so in the case when I'm considering the partition function, I can simply redefine the path integral measure. And this means that the, part, the partition function is invariant. So what this means is that these kind of deformations that I'm defining here, they don't do anything to your theory if your theory doesn't contain any features. But if your theory does contain some features, so it has some insertions, some, um, some boundaries or some cycle, then the theory, the deformation will do something non-trivial to your <clears> theory. And you can see that from uh, the S matrix. Um, so you can follow the same reasoning that I gave you before, but in this case, uh, you have insertions. And insertions are uh, at the infinite past and at the infinite futures, are the in and out state that you define in the S matrix setting. And the reasoning is that we can still uh, rot define the, def the deformation of our theory as a rotation of the fields. A rotation of all the operators in your theory, or if you prefer as a dressing by some kind of Wilson line. So here this Wilson line will be given by the integral of JB, which now it's not, now this J is not exact. So this should be star J, I'm sorry. Um, and the integral is performed along the line. Um, <laughs> sorry again. Um, now we can choose this line since this is a conserved quantity. Um, we can choose its orientation and its starting point as long as we don't cross any insertion. But the insertion are at the past infinite, uh, uh, the past infinite and the future infinite. Um, so we choose this line to be horizontal, and we do some uh, some manipulation. We see that this psi, which is defined here, is given by the difference of two terms if we fix some constant. Um, this one is the total charge which is placed to the left of B. I consider the time in a vertical direction and the uh, <laughs> space in a horizontal direction. And this one is the total charge which is to the right of B. And these are two operators. They measure the charge to the two on the two sides of the point X. Um, 
And now I need to dress each operator in my theory with, with, these, uh, with this Wilson line. So in particular, I need to dress the creation operators of in and out states. They will be dressed by this object here. And now when I go and construct the in and out states, I simply commute this exponential to the left or to the right, depending on which kind of state I'm doing. And they will pick up the, the charges of the various particles that I'm creating to the left and to the right of my uh, point Xi. So in the end, all in all, what happens is that I get a phase in front of my in and out state, and this will go and may and be a phase in front of my S matrix. And the phase depends on these uh, charges of the particles uh, contained in the states in this way. So again, we get a situation where the S matrix is simply dressed by a phase. Now the phase depends on the charges instead of the momenta as in the case of TT bar. And following the same procedure, we could, in principle, compute the partition function on the torus, for example, or even look at the correlation functions and try to, uh, to do some computation with that. All right. So let me, uh, are there any questions up to now? Um, what's the time? OK, I still have some time. Um, right. So. Let me give you some example. The simplest example that I could think of is the case where I have two charged bosons. A go, uh, is summed from one to two. And I use their phase rotation as a symmetry to, um, uh, to the, the currents associated to the phase rotation symmetry. I use these currents to deform my theory. Um, they are clearly abelian, they commute. So that's, that's in the ballpark that I was talking about. And I simply follow the procedure that I presented before. Now I'm looking at the classical level because it's it's a bit simpler. Um, but what I want to get is an action for the deformed theory. So I couple my, my theory with some gauge field. I solve the saddle point equation for A, which is given by this expression here. And I substitute back inside this action. And what I get is an action that looks like this. Now, this is a nonlinear sigma model with some B field here. And what's, what's interesting about this is the fact that this is nothing else but a TST transformation of the action that they started with. This is actually an example that was, uh, was presented in Lonina Maldacina. They didn't present it explicitly, but that's what they did. Because uh, in this action, if you write it in polar coordinates, uh, the metric on the target space is given by this. And this is the metric they consider, and they, they presented the metric in the, before, uh, in the TST transformed um, target space. And now the TST, I don't think I need to explain to you what it is, but it's essentially just a combination of a T duality, which is a dualization of the radius of some isometry. Theta, theta one and theta two are two, uh, two circles. So I dualize one of the two <coughs> radius, then I do some S transform, which depend on a parameter. So I shift the other um, circle, and then I T dual, uh, I T transform back to theta one. And this is equivalent to TST. And actually, uh, Rojek and Merlinde, they show that uh, this procedure of doing TST is actually exactly what I've been pre presenting before. So it's really nothing else but what I've been saying. It's a coupling to some gauge field, the addition of some, uh, of some uh, asymmetric uh, uh, term of this term here, and then the integration of A and X. And this gives you the TST duality. Now, this means in particular that, that this deformed system is a CFT. And this is kind of non-evident from the action itself. Uh, and also from the fact that um, these currents here, this J, are, are not really um, conformal operators. They are not really operators of my theory because phi is not an operator of the theory. Here, this is a, a non-compact boson. So phi, the uh, sorry, the two-point function of phi is not a Whiteman function. Phi is not an operator of my theory. Still, if I construct this operator and I use that to deform, this acts as a truly marginal operator because my theory keeps on being a CFT. Um, <clears throat> and also, we check that uh, by by computing the quantum correction. So checking that the weil anomaly. Uh, 
of this action is um, is actually can be made to vanish by adding the appropriate quantum correction. We checked that that is true up to two loops. And so this is sort of a, um, a first check that actually what we're doing makes sense, a sanity check, let's say. Um, all right. Uh, now uh, let's go for for the end. I still have fifteen minutes. Yeah, okay. Um, I would take less. Um, I can extend everything that I said to the case where we are dealing with non-abelian symmetries. Now, as I said, in that case, we need to be more general and put some asymmetric tensor R here, and this R needs to be such that it's inverse omega satisfies this equation, which is equivalent to say that R needs to satisfy the classical young baxter equation. So these two equations are equivalent. Um, we can follow the procedure just as I presented before. It will be slightly different by the presence of this omega here, but what we get is this expression. And now this is the same exact expression that appeared in this article by Bersato and Wolf. These are nothing else but what they call deformity dual models. Um, and and they connect what they did in the in the work in the 2017 work is that they connect this expression with the Young Baxter deformation of the starting action. And the Young Baxter deformation is actually a generalization of the TST. So this this in some way is something expected. Um, and right, and so let me give you an example of this case, which is sort of a trivial example, uh, but it it's, it is interesting because it relates to the T-bar. So if we want to follow the procedure that I presented for the case of ISO2, uh, which is a non-abelian algebra, we can do that because ISO2 allows a central extension. So we can, we can define the commutator of P and, uh, PA and PB to depend on some, on some additional parameter eta. Uh, in this way. This is a well-defined central extension of my ISO2 algebra. And in order to follow the procedure that I presented, the best way uh, to do that is to proceed in a first-order formalism. When I want to couple my starting theory to, uh, to the, um, the gauge field of ISO2, it's best to proceed in a Palatini uh, formalism. And that's because I, I am considering the symmetry as an internal symmetry instead of a, of a space-time symmetry. And then at the end, I impose metricity on the spin connection and make it into a, into a space-time symmetry. And this is simple because actually the spin connection will not appear in, uh, in the path integral that I showed before. So this can simply be integrated out. Uh, now, I simply take this definition uh, with some tetrad and some spin connection, I plug everything inside the expression that I gave you before. And what I find is that the deforming term that I get is this one, well, kind of, uh, of course, this is epsilon AB should be. Um, and this is exactly the same term that was considered in this article. This is a, um, a, a JT gravity coupling term. It's just a slightly remanipulated, but it is nothing else but that. So what we see is that TT bar, so, so as, a, as a consequence, we get that the deformed theory is a TT bar deformed theory. Uh, so TT bar is nothing else but uh, this sort of topological gauging of ISO2. And we can reinterpret that as a, as a central extension of Poincare algebra. So instead of saying we deform our theory, we say we deform the algebra of the operators of the ISO2 operators. And this is equivalent to placing our theory in a non-commutative space-time. And, and this resolves some kind of um, um, some puzzling thing that, uh, that we thought, thought about for a long time, uh, which is the fact that in 2007, so much before, almost 10 years before the appearance of TT bar, uh, Gross and Lechner found the same scattering matrix as the free boson deformed with TT bar, so of Nambu-Gotum, by putting a free boson on a non-commutative Minkowski space-time. And this was puzzling because we never could understand where this non-commutativity came from. And also I should mention that recently, the same kind of uh, relation between uh, um, 
between TTBAR and uh, non commutative space time was seen at the level of correlation function in this article here. But this perspective provides some uh, explanation for that. Is really the fact that we are deforming, we are centrally extending the algebra uh, ISO2 in this theory when we do TTBAR. Okay. And now there are a number of possible directions. One of the most interesting, at least for me, is uh, to understand the higher TT bar deformation in this framework. And what I mean by higher TT bar, I mean, uh, in the case where we are dealing with an integrable theory, we have a, a tower of, uh, of higher energy momentum tensor, higher spin, and, and we can use these as currents in the flow equation. And now, at least, to me, it's not entirely clear uh, what kind of symmetry we are um, we are going to topologically gauge in the sense that I that I presented before. Um, so, some kind of uh, resource algebra, probably the center of that. And also, a question is: <clears throat> Is it related to higher spin gravity in some way, just as T T bar is related to J T gravity? So, this is one of the main um, main interests for me. Um, another very interesting uh, direction is to take this definition of TT bar. As I said before, we can think of defining uh, TT bar with double current deformations as a rotation of the operators in our theory bus by some Wilson line as a dressing. Um, and now in this situation, we don't really need to, uh, to restrict ourselves to the case of symmetries that have currents. We can also consider discrete or non-invertible symmetries in this case, and just use the Wilson line for those. Uh, so this is another thing that I think will be interesting to, to understand what kind of deformations, how will this look like? Now, of course, there is the ever, um, standing case of extending to higher dimension. Now, it seems possible to, in the abelian case, to consider objects of this kind. We can either deform our theory in the gauge field perspective by this, or simply by taking epsilon with a product of currents and try to see what happens. Now, um, I didn't mention it, but one of the main features and the reason, that, well, the ground reason why everything looks so simple in this deformation is the fact that the deforming term that I add is a topological term. So these, uh, sorry, this term here is a topological term. And it's also the same for uh, in this case here. Uh, so we want somehow to preserve that if we want to extend to higher dimension and have something that is actually solvable or at least um, controllable in some way. And these seem good candidates to try and, and see what happened. Uh, of course, I have. I have not a clear idea of what to do in the case where we are dealing with an unabelian uh, <clears throat> case. But so this seems to be a, a nice way to extend. And finally, this seems to be interesting. Uh, as I said, the conservation of the currents uh, is also a very important uh, fact. And it's actually what makes the, the, the formation topological is the fact that d star j is equal to zero. So what if we try to slightly break this fact and try to do an expansion in phi. So we consider a case where the current is slightly broken and we try to do some expansion uh, around uh, this. So we will have a theory that is not topological anymore. It's not a topological deformation, but possibly it will be controllable because we can do some expansion in this, uh, in this parameter phi. And of course, there are also many other directions that I didn't include here. But for time reason. So that's all. Uh, thank you very much. Okay, so it's getting late, so. There is no other question. Let's thank uh, Stefan again.